Thank you very much for coming. It is a great day to be in God's house. Our hope and our prayer for you this morning is that Jesus meets you exactly where you are at and allows you to receive from him in the exact way that you want and need to receive from him. So I'm excited to be here. My name is Tom Golden, and I'm the lead pastor. In case you're new here, it is a privilege to Pastor River Life Church. I want to say thank you to our children's leadership this morning. Children, you may be dismissed for Kids Church. Thank you, and God bless you all. We want to thank Miss Isabella for hanging out with us this morning. It's been fantastic help all morning long, sister. We love and appreciate you. I see Miss Amelia is helping in our kids' church. Mr. Kane is helping in our kids' church today. So God bless each and every one of you. We love and appreciate you. And so we like to start off the, the messages with kind of a smile on our face. So out of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, the Bible tells us that a merry heart is good medicine. So go ahead and practice smiling. Okay, very good. I mean, that's much better than the other two services. Wow, y'all are handsome and beautiful. Wow. Now practice laughing because we're going to need some help laughing in just a minute. Go, ha, 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 ha. There's a little girl, and she came with her mom to church, and they were sitting through the church service, and the little girl was misbehaving. She was climbing under the chairs and popped up in her seat, and she was making a lot of noise and a lot of racket and kind of running all around. Finally, mom snatched her up. Took her out of the sanctuary and put her in the nursery. Now, she was probably like five, six, seven years old. And that embarrassed her greatly to be in the nursery with little babies. And so she went over in the corner. And she sat down for a while. Mom came back to the nursery, got the little girl out of the nursery. was walking down the hall uh, outside the sanctuary with the little girl. And the little girl said, Mom, I've been praying a lot while I was in the nursery. And mom said, well, that's, that's good. Was you praying uh, to ask God to help you to behave? And the little girl said, no, I was praying and asking God to help you to be able to put up with me. <laughs> We're at a third stop. This is the last, this is three part three, the last of our sermon series titled, Jesus is my force to be reckoned with. And so just real quick, we'll catch up to speed. So a force to be reckoned with is something that is serious. Okay, a force to be reckoned with is you've got to take this force serious. So when the enemy comes at you, instead of me or me, instead of fighting the enemy with your own bare hands or with your own mind, that's kind of nonsense. We want to hide behind Jesus. Say hide behind Jesus and let him be the force that this world has to reckon with. That's where we want to be, and that's where we want to place our lives. And so this is three of three of that sermon series today, and we have a one-sentence sermon for you. My man Clint's been with me. I mean, he's actually been right in step with me uh, all morning long. Thank you. God bless you, Clint. And even when we're not, it's my fault, and it's a lot of fun for us to try to find where in the world we're at with these slides. And so, Clint, thank you, and God bless your soul very, very much. He's been right on it all morning. He always is. And... Uh, it's a high entertainment value when we're, when we're not anyways. And so uh, our one sentence sermon for today is the enemy can glare at you all he wants. Okay, here we go. As a matter of fact, in the name of Jesus, right here and right now, help us to forget about everything else in the entire world and help us to focus on you and your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to present this one-sentence sermon, and we're going to quickly go to some scriptures, and then I'm going to tell you the backstory, and then we're going to walk out of here feeling 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Does that sound like a good idea? The enemy can glare at you all he wants. Because, or however, Jesus is going to finish the good work that he started in you. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never going to leave us and never going to forsake us. I want to take you to a new scripture concerning our sermon series. This would be a new scripture we haven't seen yet in this series, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which directly correlates to our one-sentence sermon. Being confident of this very thing. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He's writing in Philippians. As a matter of fact, when we cracked open this entire sermon series, we started in the book of Philippians, and we're going to skip to that in just a moment, or we'll go to uh, Philippians chapter 4 in just a moment. But watch this. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Being confident of this 
very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I want to stop right there. And if we were not to go any farther, we could legitimately spend some time on the fact of what in the world Paul just wrote down on some papyrus, okay? He wrote this down, and he is saying that we can be assured that no matter what we have going on in our life, right here, right now, in this time, that Jesus Christ is going to complete his good work in us. Today, if you feel like the finish line is a thousand miles from nowhere, Jesus Christ is still going to get you there. It might not look like what you and I want it to look like. As a matter of fact, most of the time it doesn't. However, it always looks much better than we could ever imagine. Jesus is going to finish the good work that he started in you. This entire book of Philippians, there's just a short number, a few chapters in the book of Philippians, and the book is not exactly about joy, but there's a lot of fantastic quotes in just this book of Philippians, this being one of them, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. The other one that we pointed out a couple weeks ago was Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, which reads, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So far, and this is a fact, people tattoo this scripture right on their body. And I've had two people so far this morning run right up to me and say, I'm one of those people. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the weeks past, we, we kind of reflected on the fact that this is not a prayer that we pray to get rich. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is not a prayer to say, well, I, I want to slam dunk a basketball. This is not a prayer to say, dear Jesus, I want, okay, oh, maybe for you, but for me, this is not a prayer that I would pray and expect Jesus to answer tomorrow afternoon that I walk up to a 10 foot goal and slam dunk the basketball. This is not about what Tom wants. This is not about what, what I see. This is not about what I vi- envision for my life, but this is through Christ. Say through Christ. In Jesus' name, we can do all things. Because it's him who strengthens us in all things. When the Apostle Paul is writing this book, this, he's pinning this down. He's actually in a prison cell. If you wouldn't know any different, when you're reading through Philippians, you think to myself, man, this guy's an upbeat guy. He's got to be writing this scripture from some mansion on the mountaintops overlooking the ocean, maybe out in California or something on one of those mountains, and you're overlooking maybe Highway 1, and it's a beautiful scene, rolling hills and blah, blah, blah. He's not. He's in the bottom of a dungeon. It's wet and smelly and dirty. His hands are tied up. His feet are shackled. And he's writing things like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's writing things like this. Think about these things that are pure and lovely and of good rapport. He's keeping his mind and his body up because he realizes these shackles that he has around his hands and feet are not the end. And so therefore in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, he is writing Jesus Christ is not done with me yet, and he's not done with you yet, and he will complete the good work he started in you. Now take me to Acts chapter 4. Oh, by the way, here's the punchline to our entire message. However, I'm not going to let you go just yet, but I'm going to share the punchline with you. Oh. I'm just going to read this. Like I'm just going to read it. And, I, and you're going to sit there like you are, staring at me, half bored. Kind of do this right here. What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a noble miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. That's a scripture taken right out of the Bible. If you open up your Bible today and you just turn to that scripture and you just read that for what it is, you're going you're gonna to see that and you're going to say, Nice. Just give us a minute, though. Now flip to John chapter 14, verse 12. I want to put this scripture in front of you so that when we bring it back up, I hope today it hits hits home with you most assuredly. This is out of the book of John. John, the disciple who turned apostle, he's actually writing this. He's actually an eyewitness to Jesus. 
And the Bible says through John, most assuredly I say to you, this is Jesus who's doing the speaking. John's just writing down what he hears Jesus say. I say to you, who, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works, say greater works, than these he will do. In other words, you are going to do greater works than you've seen me do. It is what Jesus is saying, because I go to my Father. Now my man Clint, take me back to that one sentence sermon. Today we're going to talk about a man named Luke. We're going to talk about a man named Peter. And we're going to talk about a man named John. And a little bit... We're going to talk about this man named the Apostle Paul. He was Saul, then he turned into the Apostle Paul. His name change right in the middle of the book of Acts. To get us to Acts chapter 4, we have to start in Genesis and read every word of the Bible until we get there. So we're going to start that, and I hope that you brought your lunch cruising through the book of Acts. It's imperative and very important that we know where these scriptures come from and why are they put in front of us. There's a man by the name of Luke. He was actually saved on the Apostle Paul's second ministry or second missionary journey in Troas. This man Luke writes the book of Luke and he writes the book of Acts. Scholars believe and they'll, they'll even call the book of Acts like Luke part two. Back in the day they were just one, they were one book. And they were separated a little bit. You can tell that they're separated because when Luke opens up the book of Acts, when he starts pinning it out, he is writing. Now Luke was not, he was not an eyewitness of Jesus. He was not an eyewitness of the accounts of Jesus. He didn't see Jesus perform miracles. He didn't see Jesus raise people from the dead. But he he did his research, and so Luke and Acts are both written by this man named Luke. Colossians actually tells us that he was a physician, so at the very least, he was semi-educated, maybe very well educated, and so his penmanship also uh, reflects that. So when Luke opens up the book of Acts, he says, Dear Theophilus, in my former book, which is the book of Luke, what I did was I tried to compile all of the necessary aspects of this man named Jesus. Now, you and I, if I say right now, and I've already said the name Jesus, when I say Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Galilee, G Jesus my Savior, you and I both have a preconception of who that is. Uh, that's a big reason we have church on Sunday morning, so we can take that preconception that you have and squash it. That is the funniest, most serious thing I've said all morning long. We have preconceptions of who Jesus is, how he meets us, what he does for us, where he came from, all this stuff. What grandma used to say. What our mom and dad taught us. What little parts maybe we've read or even lots of parts we've read. I've known people that they can quote the Bible, but they're still clueless on who Jesus is in their life and what he can really do. But back in the day, this Jesus thing, this Jesus person was brand spanking new. Like you would talk about a man named Jesus and people would have, they'd have no clue. Now I'm talking about in the history of the world, of course, personally, I consider Resurrection Sunday, this whole story of Easter, this whole story of Jesus dying on a cross, being buried for three days and, and, and being the risen Christ. I mean, to me, that's the biggest thing in the entire world. But back then, Jesus was literally drugged through the streets of Jerusalem, nailed to a cross, three days later, rose from the dead, spoke to his disciples for 40 days, and then went to his father in heaven until he returns all of these events happened and people still did not even know that there was a Jesus who existed so Luke he's writing through Theophilus Theophilus was quite possibly an attorney for the apostle Paul he may have had something to do with the apostle Paul's uh, uh, arraignment and sentence and jail time and, and maybe the Theophilus was somebody who was working on Paul's behalf to try to get him out of jail. It's very certain that whoever Theophilus was, he was a Roman official or of high standing, high social class. Because in the book of Luke, Luke points out when he writes to Theophilus, he calls him most excellent Theophilus. Like you would say most excellent uh, Felix or most excellent uh, another governor. These governors were, had these certain titles. So when Luke is writing, he writes to Theophilus, he says, there's this man named Jesus. He performed a lot of miracles. He died on a cross. 
And then I can just, Luke, I'm sure that Luke doesn't even know how to put this into words. And when you're reading through Luke and Acts, you got to kind of think about who this Jesus was and even what Luke might even be leaving out. The matter of fact, the Bible says that if all the things that Jesus ever done was to be put written down, it would fill up the entire earth. So when Luke is writing, he's actually, like we do on Sunday morning, we race through Scripture. We race through stories because there's simply not enough time to share all that Jesus had ever done. In your life, if I don't say another word today, I want you to know, in your life, Jesus can do more for you in one minute than you can do for yourself in an entire lifetime. And when we're reading the Bible, it's good to read it slowly and surely. And allow these pages to jump out and become a part of our heart, mind, body, and soul. And Luke's writing to Theophilus. And he says, there's this guy's name was Jesus. He lived, he died, he rose from the dead. And when he was risen from the dead, he talked to his disciples. Now we're in, in the very first part of the book of Acts. I'm writing this so we can get to Acts chapter 4. In the first chapter of the book of Acts... When Luke is writing, he says that Jesus literally told his disciples that he was going to empower them to teach and preach to the ends of the earth, starting in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. But Jesus says, but I'm going to go away, and you're going to do this without me beside you in the flesh and blood. But however, I'm going to send you a powerful being. His name is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you power from on high, and I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait there. How many of you enjoy waiting? If waiting is your thing, raise your hand. Like, like that's your personal spiritual... Right, none of us. Nobody. We had two liars in the last service. We took them right out in the parking lot. I mean, right now. We dealt with that ever, be it so severely. <laughs> Nobody likes waiting. But we have to wait sometimes. Nobody likes just being dropped off. Jesus took these guys to the top of a mountain in Galilee and basically dropped them off and said, Hey, by the way, you guys are going to do all these cool, big, crazy things. And uh, by the way, peace out, y'all. I'm gone. I mean, I remember when my parents took me to college a thousand miles. It was about 700 miles from where I grew up. They took me there and dropped me off. I mean, who does that to their child? I remember when I got married to Krista and her parents, the highlight of their life, they took Krista and I a thousand miles to Texas and dropped us clean off and left. <laughs> Jesus took his disciples so far and then he dropped them off. Oh, but he said in John chapter four, he did say, I'm not ever going to leave you as orphans. I will always be right there with you. God told the prophets, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're not going to see me standing in the flesh because I got my job to do and you got your job to do. But the power, say power, the force that I'm about to send is go, going to overwhelm your being. Luke is writing. He keeps writing at the office. Now I'm going to race through this, but I encourage you back in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, read through this day of Pentecost. We don't have time for the history of it and all these, all these types of things. There was about a million people in Jerusalem. I am racing through story here. Super cool trivia, though. There was about a million people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and you can read this in Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3, and 4 is where we'll finish today. Luke is telling Theophilus, there's this guy named Jesus. He lived, he died, he rose again. He told his disciples they're going to have some power. And then Luke says, there was this day, it's called the day of Pentecost. It was a, it was a uh, Jewish celebration, still is. And they get together for this reason. And it's, a, it's a harvest festival. But on that particular day, Luke is telling Theophilus, on that particular day, the words of Jesus came true when Jesus said he was going to give them power. The words of Jesus came true when the disciples went to this house, this place, which was probably Mark's home. And there the Bible says an upper room. There was this place 
an upstairs room where the disciples were waiting for a number of days. And every so often, every four or five hours, they'd send another disciple maybe down to uh, McDonald's, over to Walmart. They'd bring back food, eating sack lunches. They were waiting. Oh, but one day, that power that Jesus talked about fell in that room, shook the place. And those disciples, there was 120 people in that room, and they received power like they had never received or felt power in their entire lives. There was the sound of this mighty rushing wind. There was this all types of this uh, uh, power being dropped. All of the sudden, because of this power, the apostle Peter, Peter at this time, he steps out on a balcony and he preaches and 3,000 men are saved. Not just men, but women and children, you know they were too. So you're talking 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, maybe up to 6,000 people were saved at the drop of a hat. Now go back to when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to my Father in heaven. I got my job to do, but I'm going to leave you with this job that you're going to do. And you are going to have power and you are going to educate and be a witness of mine until the ends of the earth. Most of these people have not, they've not ever traveled more than 10, 12 miles from a circumference from the edge of their front porch in their life and Jesus is saying but I'm going to give you power from on high and you're going to make a difference in this world they had to have been thinking what not me how is that possible on this day when Peter and the rest of these disciples were given this power we realize and we understand all the disciples had to do was to show up and be where Jesus said to be at a particular point in time in life. And he will give them power in your life right now. Is Jesus asking you to wait? Is he asking you to seek? Is he asking you to yearn? Is he asking you to want? Just wait. Hang out for just a minute. Look, it's a great day today, this afternoon, sometime this week. Get alone with Jesus. It is not easy to do. And do your very best to blot out every single thing else in the history of the planet and in your life. And think only on the things of Jesus. Ask him to touch you. Ask him to heal you. Ask him to be with you. Ask him to give you power. Day after day after day after day, I walk up to people and I say, how you doing? And day after day after day after day, I talk to people that say, ah, just living. Jesus has much more for you and I than just living. He's got power. Oh, I'm just like you. I'm a human being just like you. Walk up to me any given day of the week. Now, Sunday mornings, I'm pretty jacked up, but that's the three and a half cups of coffee I've had already. But ask me how I'm doing any given time of the week. Ask me how I'm doing, and I'll tell you. Sometimes it's ugly. I don't feel good. I face the same struggles that you face. All of them. Name them right now. Even all the bad words in your head. I know you got them. I know this is Sunday morning church and we all showered up, shaved legs, combed the hair and all that. But I know you and you know me. We're just human beings. But God wants to give us power like we've never experienced it before. Jesus gave power to a couple guys that day on the day of Pentecost named Peter and John. Now we're skipping to Acts chapter 3. They have this power now. They've never had it before in their entire life. They're going to the temple. This was like a ritual thing they did. They would go to the temple at certain times. They would pray certain things. By the way, my man J.D. is here today. Quiet human being. Last week I asked J.D. how he's doing. And he honestly told me how he's doing. And then he said, is that what you wanted? And I said, doggum right's what I wanted. I want you to tell me how you're doing. That's why we're in this thing. Tell me how you're doing. And don't be floored when I tell you how I'm doing. Don't be surprised when you got to put your hand on this head, grab this hair and say, Tom, snap out of it! Peter and John have never had this power before. <laughs> they barely know what to do with it. They're walking to the temple courts. They come to this place called the beautiful gate or the gate called beautiful there were 15 steps that lead up to this gate all the other gates at the temple that time 8, 9, 10, 11 of them they were swapped out with pure gold 
the temple at the temple itself it said that you would look at the temple itself and you would be blinded because it was sheathed in pure gold this gate called beautiful was actually the only gate that was not pure gold it was actually corinthian copper and it developed a unique name because of its unique beauty right outside of this gate there are these steps, large amount of steps kind of circled up and then came up to this gate. That gate was known to be a place where there were miracles that had already happened. That's why there was a human being there and others who were crippled or blind or they were in great need. They would go to this gate because they were in need. They expected something from Jesus. I hope today you are expecting, not, not like in, a, in, in an arrogant way, but, a, but a, a hopeful way. I'm expecting something from Jesus today. And this man, while Peter and John walked up, freshly endowed with power, like even they didn't know how to handle, they walk past this man and the man says, hey, you got any alms? Do you have anything at all? This is a famous scripture when Peter kneels down and he says, pal, I, uh, silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I'm about to overwhelm your entire being get ready. You should have been there on the day of Pentecost, baby. But it's okay because right now, give me that hand. And as soon as Peter took this man's hand, the Bible says the man reached out his right hand. And I was obviously wasn't there. And the Bible doesn't say. But I'm sure when the man stood up, you could hear cracking of bones, popping of joints. And as the man stood up, no doubt. Now, right now in your life, right this minute, I just kind of want you to, you're feeling pretty chill, right? I mean, the air is set at 72. The chairs are padded very nice. Some of you got your arm around your spouse. Pretty chill day. This dude was chill. Now, he was in great need, but this was what he was used to. He was used to chilling out on the steps, and he's got a mat. He's got maybe a money basket, and he's got his hand out. And he's just chilling out. He's like, another day in my life. And he's saying, hey, pal, do you, do you have anything for me? Do you have anything for me? Peter says, I'm about to rock your world, baby. I don't, have, I don't even know what I have for you. I don't even know what I have. But what I do have, it's coming. When the dude stood up, he was on a set of steps. Jesus didn't take him out to a place. He didn't have Peter and Paul take him out to a place where it was level ground, nice carpet, maybe a cushion to fall on if he fell down taking his first step. No, he was on a set of steps. Must have been awkward, stepping over his, his bed, up and down a step. The dude undoubtedly, as he stood up, bones cracking, lim li ligaments popping. He, no doubt, he got a smile on his face, and he takes that first step. And no doubt... And that human being's life was the greatest single number one moment in his entire existence. A 40-year-old man, I'm sure, unclean, hadn't shaved in a lot of days. As soon as he took that other step and another step and another step and another step and another step, next thing you know, around the gate, beautiful, up and down the steps. The Bible says he was running and jumping and praising God. Because what God had just done in his life. Today, it is not out of the realm for you to feel that excitement, joy, love, grace, and mercy from God Almighty this morning. To feel his comfort, his power, his love, his grace. Say grace. His mercy. Today. A couple weeks ago, Nehemiah, we read that there was a particular day on the planet that was a sacred day set apart for the Israelites. And even though they had done great wrong in the years past, God said, hey, I, I got you on that. Today is a sacred day. Today in your life, it's a sacred day. You can receive from Jesus today whatever it is that he has for you. In that man's life on the steps of going up to the gate called Beautiful, it was a sacred day. There was a choir that used to sing. The Levites would sing on these steps right outside the gate Beautiful. They would sing songs and hymns, and there was a particular song that talked about the 15 steps that went up to the gate Beautiful. So Peter and John are standing there full of power, smiling like, wow, where did this come from? What in the world's going on? This man running around like a lightning bolt. Peter and... Uh, 
John, they walk through the gate beautiful. This would have been from the court of the Gentiles into the court of women. There's another, there's a number of courts, and they all had their reasons. And now they're inside the temple courts. The inside the temple courts is about six football fields in circumference, if you can imagine. It's a giant place. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people would be inside there. They'd be praying. They'd be doing ritualistic, religious ceremony things, washing their hands. Blah, 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 blah. They'd be going to this place called the, the uh, Solomon's Colonnade. Under this portico, this Solomon's portico, uh, back in the day in Kings, you can read it was 75 feet long, 45 feet wide. The priest would teach Sunday school there. The prophets would teach there. Uh, the Sadducees would teach under this Solomon's Colonnade. Peter and John are walking and making their way to this place of teaching. As they're doing that, it's like taking a three-year-old child to Walmart. This dude's running around. Peter and John have no clue what in the world is about to happen. But the people recognize, hey, whoa, I recognize that guy. There he goes. He used to be the guy that would sit outside the gate beautiful and ask for a little bit of pocket change. There was a crowd that gathered around Peter and John. They said, what's going on with this guy? And Peter, he began to speak. Uh, now, I love Peter. I love, I love the tone in his voice. I love to read about what he said. And as the Jewish people gathered around, the Jewish people said, tell, tell us about this guy. What in, the, what in the world's going on? And Peter opened up with, this man is walking today. He has been completely healed today because of the power of Jesus Christ, whom you knuckleheads crucified on a cross. But God raised him from the dead, and today he lives in that man right there, flying across Solomon's colonnade. The people can't believe it. Right then, the leader of the temple guard, the leader of the Sadducees, and the leader of the priest converged on Peter and John. They grabbed up Peter and John. They took them to a jail cell and let them sit overnight in a jail cell. On the next, no, on the next day, there was this little trial. Now my man Clint, take me to... Acts chapter 4. There was this trial. Now leading up into the trial. The Sadducees, of course. The Sadducees, the Pharisees. They were always against Jesus. They never wanted the word of Jesus to spread. It was against what they had going on. They had their own little thing going on. Their own little gig going on. They really didn't want spirituality in the church. It's unfathomable to me what they wanted. Now, we still see it a whole lot today. That's a sermon for a whole other time. In our church, all I want for you, all I want for you is that you receive from Jesus Christ, whatever that may be. And if it's from a scripture we ain't preaching today, awesome. If it's from a song we ain't sung today, great. If it's from a time that you're going to go home this afternoon and you're going to spend alone with God and you feel the power at home, awesome. That's what I want for you. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they, they weren't all into that. John and Peter end up in this little trial. The leader of the Sadducees come up and say, hey, you just healed this man in the temple courts. That's our house, baby. And Peter and John were staring at the back of them. The man, the Sadducee leader is staring at Peter and John. And the Sadducee man says, in what name did you perform this miracle? And then I love the apostle Peter. Peter and John, the Bible says that they spoke up and said, well, the man that you see standing right here beside me, he has been risen out of being crippled. He is standing here today. He's a 40-year-old man, crippled from birth, but he's standing here today, strong as an ox, because of the power of Jesus Christ in him. The same Jesus Christ, and this is where the apostle Peter looks right at the leader of the Sadducees and says, the same Jesus Christ whom you crucified, you dirtbag. But God raised him from the dead. He spent 40 days with his disciples. He went up into heaven. And the apostle Peter and John are standing there saying, and he promised power. We got power on the day of Pentecost. Peter and John are standing around saying, I have no clue where this come from. I don't know what, anything about it. We were walking up the gates. Beautiful. We do it every 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We reach down. We touch this guy. And waboosh. He's running around like a flea. A racehorse. We can't contain him. You can't contain the joy and the excitement in his life. And it's through the power of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the leader of the Sadducees backed up, turned around, and they began to talk amongst themselves. Take me back to that one sentence sermon, my man Clint. Let the enemy glare at you all he wants. Jesus is going to finish the good work that he started in you. 
Peter and John that day, they were facing, looking, and staring down the barrel of an execution. If the, Pharisee, if the Sadducees wanted them dead, they would have been dead within minutes. This would have been a great time for Peter and John when they were asked, hey, tell me about this guy. This would have been a great time for Peter and John to say, <laughs> never seen him before. Oh. No, they didn't say that. They said, hey, this man is healed by the power of Jesus Christ. And I'm standing in this meeting. And you can take my life if you want. But the only way to get to heaven is by the name of Jesus Christ. And the enemy, the Sadducee enemy, could do nothing but stare at Peter and John. And then out of their mouth came these words in Acts chapter 4. What in the world are we going to do with these guys? The entire city of Jerusalem knows that they did a fabulous thing. They did a divine thing. They all know that it's this Jesus Christ who has saved this man, who has brought this man from being crippled to now he is walking. What are we going to do with these guys? And they realized we can't touch them. They recognized a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. That's why you don't need to be fighting your battles by yourself. You can hide behind Jesus because at some point your enemy is going to recognize we cannot deny the power of Jesus Christ who is in this human being. And then I just love the Bible. You see, Luke is writing all these things. And in the beginning of Luke, for the first number of chapters, he writes as they and them. In other words, he's telling stories of, uh, of the disciples and the apostles. But at some point, then Luke joins. After he got saved on Paul's second missionary journey, he joins and he begins to write about we and thus, or we and us. So Luke, is, he was never an eyewitness to Jesus. Oh, but John was. And John was standing in the middle of this trial. And years ago, John remembered the day back in John chapter 14, verse 12, when Jesus looked into their eyes and said, I just saved this guy. I just healed this guy. I just brought the sight to the, I just brought this man, gave him sight from being blind. I just healed the crippled. And Jesus looked right at his disciples and said, there is coming a day when you are going to do even greater things than these. And can you imagine being John, the disciple John, now turned apostle. He's standing in the place where Jesus, not physically, but spiritually, is standing right beside him. And he's realizing, hey, I can let the enemy glare at me all he wants because he can't touch me when Jesus is standing beside me. And John got to experience this episode. The healing is one thing. Oh, but to go to that trial and face the enemy and realize the enemy cannot touch you. Wow, now that's, that's power. That's a beautiful thing. You and your life this afternoon, would you please stand with me? Would our prayer team please come? And your life today, this afternoon, tomorrow, later this week, life's hard. And I'm not standing up here trying to tell you life is all easy when you have Jesus in your heart. As a matter of fact, there's a number of aspects that make it a little more difficult. Oh, but as the Apostle Paul was at the bottom of these prisons and he was writing these words, he recognized that there was joy to be had that could never be experienced, even if he would have continued his upper level social economical status in which he had at one time. The Apostle Paul once said that he understood what it was like to live with, a, with great means. He had plenty of money and a nice place to live and vacation. 